This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below. Chapter 371, the no-no word Quinn groggily opened his eyes to a glowing orb of light on his side table. It was a magical light orb that produced artificial sunlight that slowly warmed up and turned brighter as the time clicked forward. He sat up like a broken marionette doll and weakly snapped his finger to shut down the artificial light orb that was created as experimentation with light magic despite him having a gleaming window with a clear view of the sun. Turning to the side table again, Quinn picked up his trusty ball of lead that had been with him for nearly a decade and slipped it inside his pocket. There were a few things that had stuck with him through his magical journey his fake wand, his suitcase, recon he still carried his fake wand, but he had now begun showcasing his true skills, his suitcase was as trusty as ever, however, recon, his first creation had already been passed on to Daphne but even among those things, the lead ball was, without doubt, the object credited most for his growth in magic. The golf-sized ball would stay with him from the moment he got off the bed and stay with him until he returned to bed at night. The ball was made of lead with strategically added impurities that made it resistant to change with magic. The impurities added to the lead made it such that a larger quantity of magic would be required to successfully perform magic on the impure lead than on pure lead. Quinn had spent more than a decade exhausting his magic every night he was healthy to increase his magical reserves. But there was no quiet way to expend his huge magic reserves every day, and that's where the lead ball came with Quinn operating magic on it, using it to chip away at the reserves. Quinn walked to his bathroom, and on his way, his magic reached to the lead ball, turning it into a mercury-like consistency. It had become a habit when his groggy senses would start to clear up as his magic touched the lead ball. And this morning, when Quinn's senses, both physical and magical, began clearing up, they brought to him a feeling that wasn't present yesterday. Quinn stopped with his hand on the bathroom doorknob. He stared at his hand and then around the room there was something strange in the air, but he couldn't put his finger on it. He went into the bathroom but when he came out, his demeanor had changed. The moment the door opened, a restless Quinn entered the room with his swarming all around. What the hell, he exclaimed to no one. What the hell. Quinn rubbed his arms, riddled with goosebumps that refused to go down. It was as if something was covering every inch of his body, and no matter what he did, it refused to come off. He couldn't tell what it was, but it was seriously wrong, whatever it was. Okay, okay, calm down, think about this, Quinn vocalized his thoughts to calm down the restlessness he was feeling. I think I felt this last night meaning that this thing has been here for at least six hours. But what it? Quinn stilled. He stayed perfectly still as if someone had pressed the pause button on him. He raised his arm up, and the space around his hand twisted. Quinn observed the distortion with eyes full of solemn intent. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, he did it. Quinn stopped using spatial magic to run the test and began pacing around the room with his hands in his hair. His eyes darted to his room's door, but the moment after, he calmed down. No one in the family called Voldemort by his name. Quinn used Dark Lord, George, and Elliot used you know who, Ms. Rosie used he who must not be named, and Polly, like him, used Dark Lord. They activated the dem taboo, sighed Quinn, and the inside of his throat seemed scratchy. The taboo was a powerful jinx which designated a word as a key to revealing the speaker's location. The magic had been used in the first wizarding war to target those who dared to say Voldemort's name, and from that day, the practice of using you-know-who, he who must not be named, and the Dark Lord instead of Voldemort was born. The name had been used as a taboo and then used to target those who spoke of it until it instilled enough fear that no one dared to speak the taboo. After the war, when the taboo spell was pulled down, Albus Dumbledore encouraged people to use the proper name Voldemort to not fear the name. But it made little impact as the community continued to use the alternatives. Soon, the youngest generation began calling the Dark Lord by the alternates without knowing why they did so. And now the second coming of the same magic had returned. All right, time to follow the protocols for the situation, Quinn got up and entered the walk-in closet before coming out to head for the door, I should have breakfast first. Scene break. Quinn stood in the middle of a forest with his noir gear on and kicked some fallen leaves near his black boots. He looked around to ensure that he was alone something he had taken into consideration while picking up the place. He placed his suitcase on the floor. He snapped his fingers and the suitcase opened with stairs going down, but instead of Quinn going down, something came up. It happened, asked Portrait Merlin from his frame as he looked around the forest. It happened, sighed Quinn. You did say it would happen. I know it would happen, that's why I talked about it with you. Quinn knew that the taboo magic would be making a return. But he didn't know how it would return as that piece of knowledge wasn't in the source material in his head. So instead of making plans to stop it, he decided to make the best of it. So, how did it happen? Asked Merlin. Quinn shook his head, I cannot say for sure, but I think I know how it happened. Oh, you told me for the taboo magic to work, it needs a power source to operate. I mean, for magic of this magnitude and scale to work, it must be drawing on a ward stone. Or this dark lord of yours powered it through his own magic. I have heard about him in the past two decades, and from what you have told me, he is powerful enough to power the curse himself what makes you think he used a magic source. I would have thought the same, but the timing of it is what makes me think he used a magical power source. Timing. Yes, timing. You see, yesterday, I sort of why am I being humble. 
I definitely stabbed the Dark Lord in the eye. You did? Congratulations? How was it? Thank you. It was fine. Created a knife, threw it well, and landed it right in the eye. Oh, stop it. There's no need to be so humble. Okay. I mean, it was quite fantastic. I was battered and beaten, but you know me what separates good from the best is performing under pressure, and I perform best when I'm under pressure. The curse I weaved was some of my best work, and I'm not much of a thrower, by that knife throw was legendary. Good, good, I wish I could have seen it. If today goes well, I can show my recollection of the event on a light projection. Then I certainly hope it does. But back to the original question. Ah yes, about that. Because I stabbed the Dark Lord in the eye, I doubt he used the time he could have spent healing on the taboo magic. And because the curse came alive yesterday, I'm sure it definitely wasn't the Dark Lord and a power source. I see. What are you going to do exactly here? I'm going to try out a test. It's early, and I might invite some nasty people, which I'm not sure if I want or not, but whatever be the case, this seems to be a time as good as any. You're going to trigger the taboo magic, Merlin quirked his brow. Well, I spent a good amount of time researching it, not triggering it would be a pity. The reason I called you here is for a question. What question? Can you charm the taboo magic to trigger differently based on the term that is spoken? A skillful enough wizard can do so. Quinn hummed. Then it is better if I go with the mainstream version. Going personal might offend the big guy enough. Quinn was sure that speaking Tom Morvillo riddle instead of Voldemort won't bring the Dark Lord here because of the injury, but he was sure it would alert him if someone could communicate back to their headquarters was something Quinn didn't want. All right, that was all I wanted to ask, said Quinn. I'll meet you later. Can't I stay, asked Merlin with his best puppy dog eye impression. Nope, I don't know how things will turn. Quinn didn't listen to Merlin's counter and directly sent the portrait into the suitcase. He knew how it was going to turn out, but why risk something that could possibly be traced back to him though he didn't see how that would happen but again, why take the risk? Quinn put on his mask, and the forest went quiet. The leaves stopped shaking, and the winds came to a halting still. He once again gave the surroundings a look to confirm that he was alone. He took in a deep breath before a distorted voice emanated from behind the mask. Voldemort. There was a thrum around him, and while it was barely visible to the eye, Quinn could feel the spatial distortions around him. This is the first one? The first one? I can't believe we got a fool so quickly, came a rasping voice through the trees. How dare you speak the Dark Lord's name? We know you're in there? You've got half a dozen wands pointing at you, and we don't care who we curse. He heard footsteps in the fallen leaves, and then they stopped. Quinn turned towards them and counted the ragtag group of people, not one with a mask bar one. Quinn tilted his head at the seven people that had heeded his call six people who were definitely not Death Eaters but only mere associates while here was only one of them who was garbed in proper Death Eater attire. I invisible vigilante, exclaimed one of the Death Eater associates. This is what I get, said Quinn, looking the over. Six ruffians and one Death Eater and the Death Eater I get only has one arm. I do not even get out of bed for less than a dozen whole Death Eaters. It seemed that his appearance and voice had their effect on the snatchers began to back up. Now that all of you are here, please do not think of leaving, said Quinn. They didn't seem to stay as every single one of them triggered apparition, but Quinn smirked and snapped his finger, and the spatial ward trapped every single one of them sending them all straight to the ground. Let's get started. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, I shall break the taboo. Merlin, portrait, ah, shucks, I want to see as well. Chapter 372, Inside Man. Quinn brushed the yellow grass off his jacket and leather gloves. The five snatchers and the one Death Eater lay on the forest ground. The five snatchers had their arms tied up while their leg bones turned to a liquid jelly as they shivered in the aftershock of the magic. The sole Death Eaters, however, laid unharmed other than the light bruising that Death Eaters usually suffered when they came across Quinn in his invisible vigilante persona. I knew there was a chance that violating the taboo this early would attract someone higher up the ladder, but never knew it would be someone so high up the ladder. Lucius Malfoy stared up at Quinn with one of his eyes beaten black and blue. The man who was once proud as a peacock shivered on the dirty ground with his hand raised in a desperate appeal to make Quinn stop. Why would someone like you, Lucius Malfoy, be part of a field group accompanying these nobodies, he glanced at the ruffians. I always assumed you were the indoors type, sitting behind your fancy desk, pulling the strings but here you are, his eyes went to Malfoy's empty sleeve, and you don't have an arm how did that happen? He already knew Lucius Malfoy didn't have an arm. He had seen the thing happen in Barty Crouch Jr.'s memories one of the deranged man's most prominent recent memories, making pieces of information he had seen on the Death Eaters. Alas, like Quinn, the invisible vigilante wanted to keep the fact he was a legilimency secret. P please, eh, spare me, said Lucius, his tone knitted with begging, I I will give you a anything. Quinn's pupil narrowed as he gave Lucius a stare down. There is nothing precious than your life, Lucius Malfoy, and I would love nothing more than to reap that precious life of yours and rid the Dark Lord of one of his precious assets. Instead of begging more, Lucius laid flat down on the floor, it was as if all the life and struggle to survive had left him because of Quinn's few words. He let out a weak scoff. Then off with it. I'm no asset to the Dark Lord, he raised his empty sleeve. Killing me won't make any difference, so do it and do it quickly. 
Quinn narrowed his eyes and readily reached out to Lucius' mind with legilimency, and he didn't have to go deep to run into a rush of emotions of longing, regret, acceptance, and a myriad of very depressing emotions that even made Quinn's mood drop. He went a little deeper and found the reason behind all the complicated emotions. I heard that your son abandoned the glorious cause you and your wife left you. That must hurt, Quinn quipped where it hurt. How did it feel to have your family betray everything you stood for? Lucius didn't vocalize his answer, but Quinn didn't need vocalization as he was inside Lucius' mind. The emotions and inner thoughts told him the presence of great initial anger followed by regret and doubt, which preceded a great sense of belief-shattering turmoil with pain and a resurgence of pain, hatred, and abhorrence. Is that how you lost your arm? Punishment for your Malfoy family's betrayal. I guess it was in the Malfoy blood to bite the hand of the one who fed you when the usefulness ends. Lucius flared up, don't you dare? My family is not traitors. I have always supported the just and right cause of the Dark Lord. One person does not equate to the entire family, Quinn interrupted. Oh, wait, you are the only one remaining, so it is the entire family. Quinn's mocking invigorated Lucius by setting a fire of anger inside him. Quinn internally smiled, he had heated up the iron, and now it was time to strike it with his strongest hammer. Just kill me. Lucius wailed. Would you like to meet your family, Lucius, asked Quinn, not paying attention to the angry appeal. I can make that happen. Lucius sprung up to his knees like a man who had found water in a desert and crawled towards Quinn with his hands tied behind his back. Why why you can do that? I know where they are, so it is not a stretch to say that I can make it happen. Please, pee please, my family family, I want to meet my family. I'll let me meet them. Quinn's eyes shined behind his mask. He pushed Lucius away with his leg, making the bruised man fall to the ground. I can arrange a meeting with your family, but for that to happen, I will need something in return because taking away your life is still a luxury that I would love to indulge in. A shine of hope returned to Lucius's eyes as he rapidly nodded. I will do anything anything my family just my family. Quinn nodded. Coming to the forest to trigger the taboo, he hadn't planned for the current situation. He had never thought that he would chance upon a Lucius Malfoy who was angry with Voldemort and his Death Eaters a man that no longer cared about trying to assert absolute dominance of pure blood over everyone else a father and husband who longed and cared for his family's well-being. It was a little too easy to turn Lucius, and in any other circumstance, he would doubt the effectiveness of his words, but in this case, he had confirmed that Lucius Malfoy was going to dance to any tune Quinn decided to play. Could he deliver on his promise? Could he let Lucius meet Draco and Narcissa Malfoy? He could do it after all, he knew precisely where the both Malfoys were living in peace with fear always buzzing with worry. It wasn't that difficult when you knew where you were looking at. You are going to work in the Death Eater organization as my spy. As you said, even if you have fallen out of favor, the information you have access to is still useful to me so anything major that happens with the Death Eaters, I want to hear about it. Go it. I I understand. Good, said Quinn, but he noticed that Lucius wanted to say something, so he asked him to speak up. What will happen if the Dark Lord knows about it? Asked Lucius. Quinn's lips rose up slightly behind his mask. If the Dark Lord knows about this you die, Lucius Malfoy you die. Lucius froze like a block of ice. The already pale man looked like he had been converted to a vampire. No matter what anyone said, the thought of death scared all men, and it seemed that Lucius Malfoy, who had been the dealer of death, was now feeling the fear of being on the side of the wand. You're the one to lose the most, Lucius, but at the same time, the one to gain the most. If you chose to refuse, I could kill you no, and everything would be over, but if you comply with this little deal of mine, you can meet your family and take the chance against Voldemort. A piece of advice, Lucius Malfoy, believe it or not, the Dark Lord will be much more lenient to his Death Eaters than I am to them. There was a turn of silence as Quinn stared at Lucius, who stared down at the ground. If you can guarantee that I can meet my family, you will be able to meet your family. But don't be mistaken, you won't be able to live them it'll be a meeting for the amount of time I decide and in case they refuse to meet you, it'll be your bad luck. The last line seemed to strike Lucius like a sledgehammer. It was evident that the man hadn't thought of the possibility of his son and wife refusing to meet him. So, I ask you again and for the last time, make your decision because your life will depend on it, and make it now. Quinn had said his piece. Make the most of the situation. He had gotten Lucius Malfoy, so he was going to make a man who was once the second in command into a spy that would feed him all the stuff he ever needed. He has no confidence. He had studied people and their minds for such a long time that he knew what confidence looked like. He had seen Lucius Malfoy at his best, and now he had seen the same man at his current worst. Quinn had seen the potential. Now, I just need to bring it back. If Lucius Malfoy had become an asset for Voldemort, why couldn't he become one for him? Lucius looked up towards Quinn, and with a strong tone that had been lacking before, he spoke, I will do it. I will become your spy. Well then, Lucius Malfoy, look forward to meeting your family because, after that, we have a lot of work to do. Quinn turned to the Snatchers and finished, now, let's change some memories and call it a day. It was time to start picking the big snake scales out. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, having insider information. Fiction only reader, author, a shorter chapter. Couldn't write more on this scene of the story. This last leg of the story will fluctuate like crazy, so hang on tight and keep reading. Internship fatigue has also started to get to me, it has been forcing my schedule to become irregular. 
Chapter 373, I'm the one who knocks Quinn Operat on the edge of what looked like a normal residential street located in the suburbs outside London in the southeast part of England. It was one of those areas with identical houses for streets and blocks built by a single construction firm. Except for the cars in the driveways, the gardens, and occasional houses painted in different colors, the houses looked as if they had been copy and pasted from the same mold. It was as Quinn had imagined, an image of normalcy but at the same time, it surprised him that this was the place the Order of Phoenix had chosen such a place. I guess it is fitting, muttered Quinn. Quinn snapped his fingers, and his appearance shimmered and twisted until his face had been replaced by someone else. Gone where his black hair had been replaced with brown hair perfectly parted 70-30 along, and his stone gray had been dyed to a hazel color. His height increased by a few inches, and his entire body lost muscle tone until he seemed on the verge of being lanky. He rolled his shoulders, and his emerald green three-piece suit morphed into a salaryman's brown work suit with a thick tie. The new face put on a smile and clenched his fist around a conjured work suitcase. He walked to a house with a trimmed garden with a bed of weather-appropriate lush flowers everything in the garden was just good enough that it won't arise complaints from the neighbors but not good enough that they would come looking for tips. As he stepped on the empty drive, he felt a tingle travel down his back. He took in a shallow but sharp breath as the magic in the ward scanned him. In a fraction of a second, he devised the motive behind the scan it was looking if he possessed magic. He smiled and countered the ward with counter magic, which made it seem that he didn't possess a drop of magic in his veins. Even if they didn't want goblin wards in here, they should have at least put up Aegis. Well good, less work for me, he thought, noticing that the warding around the house wasn't from either of the top two best in the business. I don't know if I should feel appreciated or insulted at them trying to copy Aegis' quick response alert. The ward was clearly going to alert people, and they would arrive here to surround him as soon as possible. He kept his eye on the door front door and didn't look at the invisible guard sitting on the yard chair as he stunned him unconscious. Idiot sleeping on the job in the middle of the day. He knocked on the door and enhanced his hearing, focusing it on hearing what was going on inside the house. He heard two sets of footsteps moving, with one of them moving towards the door. Yes. The door creaked open, and Draco Malfoy peeked out from inside with suspicion and caution clear in his eyes. Good morning, dear sir. My name is John, and it must be a lucky day because I'm here with a revolution. Sorry, not interested. Draco cut him short and began the door closed shut the door, but Quinn put his shoe in between to stop it from closing. What are you doing? Draco exclaimed. Sir, respectfully speaking, you are missing a great opportunity right now. Quinn grabbed the door and forcefully pulled it open as he stepped inside. What do you think you are doing? Yelled Draco. Nothing, sir, this is for your own good. Quinn closed the door behind him, and the latches clicked into their places. Hearing all the commotion, the second resident, Narcissa Malfoy, came out running. She had a worried look on her face and a wand in her as if she was expecting something wrong. Who are you? She yelled, pointing her wand at the unwanted guest. John's smile dimmed. He raised his hand, and the brown suitcase turned into a black mask that he put on his face. The Malfoys watched as the hazel eyes and brown hair both turned black. As their minds tried to understand what was happening, he gave them a push to make it crystal clear. He patted his suit, and the brown work suit turned into an outfit that covered head to toe in black. Why you, Draco stepped back as realization dawned on him. Good day, Malfoys, said Quinn in his distorted noir voice. I have heard a lot about both of you, it's nice to meet you in person. Narcissa pulled Draco behind her and raised her wand to Quinn. Why are you here? If it is about the Dark Lord and Death Eaters, we are no longer part of that world. Please leave us alone. Quinn raised both his hands up, showing that he had no wand, and then flicked his finger slightly, sending Narcissa's wand flying to the ceiling. Quinn lowered his hand and put his right palm side up to have the wand glide to it. Now that we have the dangerous out of the way, we can have a civilized talk, Quinn slipped Narcissa's wand into his pocket. As for you not being part of the world. I'm sorry, Madame Malfoy, as long as you have that last name, you'll always be part of that world. He looked to Draco, especially with what your son did recently. That is why both of you are here, am I wrong? He stepped forward and walked into the house. Behind him, the mother and son tried to open the door to escape, but the door wouldn't budge. Inside, Quinn looked at the decor that was clearly non-magical, but there had been changes made to make it feel like home to a magical person with the extensive use of transfiguration which told Quinn that the neighbors weren't visiting and that the residents were feeling out of place but comfortable enough or pretending to be comfortable enough to make changes to the house. Quinn sat down on the sofa and crossed his feet to make himself comfortable. Boom! Quinn raised his brow and curled his finger in the beckoning gesture. There were two screams as Draco and Narcissa came flying into the lounge, forced to sit down on the sofa in front of him. Even though this is not your home, it is not nice to destroy your place of living. Quinn disarmed Draco and confiscated his wand as well. Now that we are seated let's discuss what I came here to talk about. Please leave us alone, Narcissa pleaded. We were brought here by the Order of Phoenix. You know who they are Dumbledore's group? They wouldn't bring us here if we were with the Dark Lord. As Narcissa tried to get Quinn, invisible vigilante, to leave, he observed the silent Draco, who sat by her side. Quinn noticed how Draco sat close to his mother, leaning forward toward Quinn, trying to put Narcissa behind him as she had done at the door, trying to shield her from the vigilante with the reputation of ripping up bodies. Quinn gathered magic in his voice box and exuded it, weaved it in his words. 
I would like it very much if both of you could calm down. As long as you cooperate with me here, I have no desire to hurt both of you, so if we can have a calm discussion without raising our voices. What do you want? asked Draco testily. I am here on the behalf. Can you remove that from voice? said Draco, even as Narcissa tightly clutched his arm, it is hard to understand. Quinn tilted his head as he silently stared at Draco for a second before opening his mouth and the voice that came out of it made the blood drain from the Malfoy's face. Would you prefer if I sounded like this? Voldemort's voice wasn't something both of them had pleasant memories of. I guessed not. His voice returned to as it was before, now, as I was saying, I'm here to talk. I'm here to talk to you regarding Lucius Malfoy. What about him? This time, it was Narcissa who interrupted. He would like to meet both of you. What? Draco narrowed his eyes. You are working with Death Eaters now. No, but I am looking to form a working relationship with him. But for that to happen, he has put up a condition that he wants to meet you. We don't want to meet him. Draco said without a thought. Quinn turned to Narcissa, indicating that he was waiting for her response. What are you going to do with Lucius? She asked. From what I have heard, you don't spare Death Eaters when you get a hand on them. Because of you, one of my friend's husband is still in St. Mungo's to this day. I'm not sorry at all. Your husband was going to end up the same as your friend's husband, but when the man is Lucius Malfoy, even I have to give it a second thought. As for what I'm going to do with him, he's to be my inside informant. And he wants to meet us to do it. From what it seems, he hasn't been enjoying the home without both of you there. He misses you too, wants to meet you. Oh yeah, he should have thought of that before he recruited his son into being a Death Eater, spat Draco, his breathing labored. Narcissa put her hand on Draco's shoulder. She asked Quinn, what if this turns out to be a ploy to drag us to the Dark Lord for our betrayal? He will turn our lives into hells if he gets his hand on us. As I said, I have no desire to harm you, said Quinn. If the meeting is to be a ploy, then I'll kill everyone who's there to capture you and leave the curse that I have placed in Lucius' body to run its course and make his life, as you put it, a living hell until he dies and goes to hell. Quinn had decided to strike a deal with Lucius because he knew that the silver-tongued Malfoy wouldn't truly cooperate if he forced the man to work for him. The only way to have a working relationship was if Lucius Malfoy worked with him willingly. But that didn't mean that Quinn trusted Lucius, and thus, he had put in a curse that would eventually kill Lucius if Quinn didn't remove it. Plus, if Lucius Malfoy wasn't going to work with him, what was the use of him living? At said meeting, I'll be present to ensure your safety, he finished. The Malfoy pair looked confused and stunned at the masked individual sitting in front of them. They probably thought that their image of the invisible vigilante didn't match what they were seeing now. Why are you telling all of this? asked Narcissa. Because it does me no harm. If you accept, I shall take you to meet Lucius. If you refuse, I shall erase your memory and the memory of the guard outside. Malfoy's looked aghast, but Quinn continued, If you accept, just to get me out of the house right now and inform the Order of Phoenix later so that they can change your location it doesn't matter to me as you have nothing on me that can put me in a disadvantageous situation but I can always find you again later it was a bit difficult to find both this time, but it won't be so much the next time around. We saw your face, said Draco. Do you really think that was my real face? Quinn said without the chuckle he would have usually put in. There is a reason why I have been able to evade the authorities and the Dark Lord's Death Eaters. It wasn't difficult to find them at all. They had a labyrinth door installed in this house, and he had a tendency to go through the purchase details of every door along with the backdoor magic he placed in the doors that told him the location of where the doors had been installed. And now, he didn't even need that to find them. Quinn crossed his legs, take your time and make a decision. The right decision on your part can be a big blow to the Dark Lord and his Death Eaters. It took them long to arrive at a decision, but it did put a smile on Quinn's face behind his mask. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, well, I guess the John person is tied up with invisible vigilante. Damn, I particularly liked that one. Narcissa Malfoy, mother, frightened at what the man in front of her is capable of. Draco Malfoy, son, does not want to appreciate having his residence invaded. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Chapter 374, Bringing the Family Together What Are You Doing? Quinn, in his John persona, pressed his hand over the same guard's forehead he had knocked out a few days back during his first visit to the Malfoy safe house. Preparing him for the time we will be outside. You said they check up on you twice a day, asked Quinn. Once in the morning and once before going to bed. That's why. Can't keep him unconscious for long. If someone comes to relieve him of his duties and finds him knocked out, it will raise suspicion. And because they don't check on you, nothing will raise the alarms until we return. Why do you care if it raises the alarm, asked Draco. Quinn glanced at the younger man and wondered where all the intelligence he had shown just the last year had gone, all that planning in Hogwarts, and now he asked questions like this. Did Quinn answer those questions? No. He was the invisible vigilante. It is done. He will awake in a couple of minutes, Quinn removed his hand when the guard stirred. He walked to the Malfoy pair and extended a hand each to them. Give me your hands. Why? asked Draco. The wards around this property are monitoring your presence. The moment you step out of the boundary, Order of Phoenix members will be operating here with their wands blazing. I'm going to make it so that when you step out, no such thing will happen. The mother and son exchanged looks, communicating with each other through their eyes. Hurry up. I would have delivered you to the Dark Lord or killed you last time I was here. 
I do not want Lucius Malfoy to flee in doubt because you two got me late. Though annoyed, both Malfoys hesitantly gave their hands to Quinn. They felt a soft current course through their body, causing them to jump and shiver. I don't feel any different, said Draco. Quinn left their hands and walked out of the boundary. He turned to them and asked them to cross the boundary. What if your magic doesn't work, asked Narcissa. I know you are worried. What if my magic does not work and the Order of Phoenix arrives here, and seeing that you tried to go out for an outing, they might rescind their offer of protection. Am I right, he asked, and Narcissa's silence was the affirmation. This is your risk to take. You have half a minute to decide if you are in or out. A second late, I will listen to any last words you have for Lucius and be off. They didn't need any more motivation as they readily stepped outside the boundary while holding their breath. Their worried eyes darted around the house and the street. The lack of operating people put them to ease with their shoulders sagging in relief. Quinn extended his hands again and said, We are leaving. You don't want to check for an ambush. Quinn rolled his eyes. How many questions were they going to ask? He stepped forward, grabbed their shoulders amidst protest, and forcefully operat them away along with himself, leaving behind the guard who groggily cracked his eyes before snapping straight up and pretending to be active as if he had never gone to sleep. Quinn operat into the forest and dropped the lady and the brat on the ground, leaving them rolling in the leaves. And just when he was about to get some peace and quiet with the family reunion, stop, whoever you are, stop. Quinn held back a groan. Just a little more, he thought as he turned to face a cautious Lucius Malfoy. He gathered magic in his voice, it is me, Malfoy. Put that wand down before I break it. You wouldn't care, would you? It is not yours anyway. The look on Lucia's face was small happiness for Quinn, but before the man could say something, Quinn moved on he patted his chest, and he was back in his noir gear, and with a mask, he was invisible vigilante. Let's get this over with, said Quinn. Have the family reunion. But beware make any wrong moves, and you won't be leaving here the same way you came here that is if you will be leaving at all. Quinn snapped his fingers, and a ward was erected around the Malfoy family and him. He leaned against a tree and observed from the side as Lucius Malfoy all but leaped his way to his estranged family, who showed no such similar enthusiasm. They remained jaded as Lucius awkwardly yet passionately put forward his account full of apologies and regret. There was a lot of back and forth, shouting and yelling at both sides, accusations and blame were thrown, and old skeletons were dug out. Quinn stayed away from the family, standing still to make himself invisible but his ears remained sharp and recorded every word that came out from a Malfoy mouth. As the family dispute continued, the tired son broke away from the argument and unknowingly stumbled toward Quinn. What are you looking to accomplish doing this, asked Draco, glaring at Quinn, who quietly ignored him. Hey, listen to me, I'm talking to you. I can hear you, said Quinn. I'm just ignoring you. I have no interest in talking to you, Draco Malfoy. You are interfering with my family, you have to talk to me. No one asked you to be here. You came to us. You and your mother are not a package deal. You could have not come if you didn't want to. And let mother come here alone with someone like you. You underestimate the woman named Narcissa Malfoy. That woman is much stronger than you are. A woman who could lie to Voldemort to his face in a situation where if her life failed, it could mean instant death to her and her family had to have nerves of steel. If she was in your place in the plan to kill Dumbledore, the old white beard would be dead right now. You're putting her in danger, spat Draco, his voice full of spite. Quinn opened his eyes and gave a Draco a lazy stare. How long do you think Dumbledore can keep you hidden? What? How long do you think before the Dark Lord finds your little hideout? Who except Dumbledore will put their lives on the line for the Malfoys when the Dark Lord is actually in front of them, and they're the only thing that stands between him and you? Quinn pushed himself off the trunk and stepped towards Draco. One day, you'll be in that little prison of yours, sharing a meal with your mother maybe it will be the only good thing about your stifling days or maybe you'll be sleeping peacefully in your bed and that's when he will coming tearing on the roof of that non-magical house you don't like if you're lucky, he will kill you in one shot with a killing curse but if you're not lucky, he will torture her in front of you, and her dead face will be the last living memory you will have. I'm trying to prevent that from happening, you naive moron. I want to rid the world of a dark lord, and your father working for me is going to make that easier. Quinn backed away to enjoy the startled look on Draco's face. He wished he could have forced the image of his words into Draco's mind using legilimency to get a more satisfying reaction, but that was just his sadistic speaking out of place. So go stand by mommy and daddy as they sort things out. This is not a place for children to interfere. Now bugger off. With that, Quinn closed his hand but kept his sense keen in case Draco tried to do something stupid with his wand. I'm not an idiot, said Draco, his tone laced with faint defiance. I never said that you were. You didn't need to. The way you spoke to me said it all. And you did call me a naive moron. Quinn leaned against the tree. If he wasn't under the mask, he would have pulled on the empathy card, sympathized with everything Draco was going on, built a rapport, offered some advice, and cemented an image of friendliness in Draco's mind to gain his confidence. Even under his current persona, the cold vigilante could have gotten close to Draco and formed a connection, but right now, the Malfoy son was of no real use, right now, he couldn't even see the worth of building ties with Draco in case he got helpful in the future. Well, at least I personally have some positive ties with Draco. Listen well, Draco Malfoy, said Quinn. This country is going through a war right now. The sooner it ends, the better it will be for everyone. 
The truth is that by trying to kill Dumbledore, you are to partly blame for this war. A guilty look emerged on Draco's face. Quinn took a nod of it and continued. I myself am also to blame, and so is everyone who is in a situation of power. My sole aim is to take the head of the Dark Lord and bring everything to an end. I am playing my part. You are to play your part as well. My part. Everyone has a part to play. You might have already played it out or might have something in the future, but that only time will time. Quinn thought about what would Draco's part be, and all he could think of was that when the war passed, the Malfoys would still hold plenty of wealth and even influence that could be put to good use. You think you can kill you know who, asked Draco. I believe so I can. Just a few moons back, I took his eye, a highlight of his career as the invisible vigilante, if he was to say himself. I had done this mask with that intention, and I will remove it when my motive is achieved. Quinn closed his eye and ended the conversation. He didn't want to speak to Draco anymore, who himself didn't continue. After a while, the Malfoy family conversations ended, and Lucius and Narcissa stepped to Quinn. I agree to work with you, said Lucius. A good decision, said Quinn solemnly. I will provide you with the information on the Dark Lord, but other than that, I don't think I can provide you with much. Information is gold, Malfoy. While I have no need of your wand, I do think you will be able to provide you me with plenty of things, said Quinn, staring at Lucius with gears turning behind his eyes. There were a couple of more things he wanted Lucius to do, which would he thought would prove to be the correct choice. Just keep my family out of it. Quinn nodded. He glanced at the mother-son and speculated if he could make them do something from their safe house of theirs. They could do something, but that was a thought for another day. Well then, Lucius Malfoy, let's bring down the Dark Lord. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, I am a family reunioner. Draco Malfoy, naive, moron. Lucius Malfoy, asset, the inside man for the third party in the war. Narcissa Malfoy, strong, might be the strongest in family in many ways. Chapter 375, talk about taboo I don't like this. Amelia Bones slammed a thick manila folder on the long conference table. We had more than a dozen reported cases just this week. Reported cases? We don't even know how many went unreported. She fixed a look on the people sitting around the table that clearly told them she was greatly displeased. We have had an explosion in the Auror's office. Then the Dark Lord dared to barge into the ministry, took hostages, put lives at risk and it took two outsiders to repel him away and one of them is a wanted criminal. Does anyone of you realize how that looks to the public? That the ministry can't do anything without Albus Dumbledore's help. An absolute disgrace. Some of the biggest names in the ministry head of DMLE Rufus Scrimgeier, head Auror Gawain Roberts, head hit wizard Cillin Perry, retired Captain Auror and defense consultant Alastair Moody, among many others listened to the minister in silence. She picked up the newspaper and opened it to read the article, every ministry employee ranging from office heads to the Minister of Magic herself have a bounty on their heads that can be collected in the seedy world of Nocturne Alley, dotted with connections to the Death Eaters. Amelia pushed the newspaper away as she dumped herself in the head chair, and with her fingers massaging her temple, she asked, what is the situation with these snatchers? Roberts leaned towards the table and patted a folder in front of him twice but didn't open it. We have caught seven of them this month. Another seven resisted arrest, and unfortunately, they lost their lives. The new law regarding lethal action against Death Eaters included a section that allowed an extension against groups like the Snatchers. What are the ones in custody saying? She asked. N. Nothing. Those dimwits know nothing. They're just trying to earn gold. By rounding up Muggleborns and blood traitors. It is a hassle to clean up after them and their mess. Some of them made a ruckus right in the middle of a Muggle public square. At least the marked Death Eaters are careful about where they let the magic out. How are we supposed to handle the root of the problem if we are busy chasing after the fools? That is your job to figure out, Amelia sighed. She turned to Scrimgeier and spoke, you're coming with me to the Muggle Prime Minister's office. The Auror in charge of his protection has been sending memos after memos saying he wants to meet. It's on this Friday evening. Even the ever-serious Rufus Scrimgeier had a twitch when he heard the words Friday evening in the work context. Understood, said Scrimgeier. He glanced towards the door once before turning to Amelia. I still don't think it is good to get outsiders involved. DMLE is more than capable of handling this situation on our own. Whether you like it or not, he and his group are a substantial effort against the Dark Lord. In this situation, it is better to coordinate with them for information. Amelia turned to Moody, isn't that right, Alastair? Moody grunted, which to those who know him was a grunt of affirmation. But, Amelia, you just talked about how you didn't like Dumbledore's involvement in the Dark Lord incident, said Scrimgeier. No, I didn't like it, said Amelia bluntly, but that doesn't mean I didn't appreciate it. If he wasn't there that day, many innocent lives could have been lost. And this time, I'm inviting Dumbledore and his Order of Phoenix up front and she narrowed her eyes you can't talk about outsider involvement after your meeting with George West. We need potions and their ingredients at a cheaper rate, defended Scrimgeier. West can deliver us with that, we can even get green grass to sell us at a discount through West. I'm not complaining. Scrimgeier sighed and rested his complaint. He looked at his wristwatch and frowned, he is late. This is an important meeting. If he expects us to work together, then he must be on time. The meeting hall's door opened, and Albus Dumbledore, dressed in his starry patterned robes, entered the room with a smile beneath his beard and a shine in his eyes as if he was delighted to see everyone in the room. My apologies, everyone. 
I was caught up gazing at a bird I thought I had never seen before. Turns out someone had colored a magpie in some fascinating shades. I suspect they came from the mind and hands of a brilliant child. Dumbledore sat down on an empty chair right between Rufus Scrimgeier and Cillin Perry, smiling at both heads as if it was a Hogwarts reunion. If I missed something, I would request if someone could catch me up quickly, said the headmaster of Hogwarts. You missed nothing, said Amelia and moved forward without wasting any time. I want an update on the taboo curse. How could the Dark Lord cast such magic in the country? I thought we had taken away the means he had used to cast the taboo curse the last time. All eyes turned to the person sitting on the other head of the table, who hadn't spoken a single word since his arrival. Saul Croker, an unspeakable from the Department of Mysterious, tapped his fingers on the table for a moment before speaking up, on the day Voldemort. Are you mad? Why are you taking his name? cried Perry. Croker sighed, do you think the Snatchers will come barging into the ministry? He will know someone spoke his name inside the ministry. Speaking his name carelessly might become your downfall, unspeakable, scoffed Perry. I can say Voldemort, Croker said, and people in the room frowned, as many times I want, wherever I want, and the taboo won't get triggered. Unspeakables have a way to evade the taboo, asked Amelia. Croker nodded. But it is not something that anyone can use, Amelia threw a guess. Croker nodded again, causing Amelia to sigh, continue. On the day Voldemort and his Death Eater came barging in, there was another party that secretly entered the ministry, taking advantage of the commotion, and made their way to level 9 to get something that enabled the Dark Lord to cast a taboo over the lands of the country. What is this something? asked Dumbledore. That is confidential information, not to be shared outside of the Department of Mysteries, Croker spoke the words as if he had rehearsed them until his throat was raw. I, with my authority, as the Minister of Magic, order you to disclose that information, unspeakable Croker, Amelia spoke with her tone daring him to defy it. Croker shrugged, you're privy to that information, Madam Minister but, he pointed to the rest of the people in the room, they can't know about it. What? According to Section 44 DOM of the unnamed code drafted in the unspecified year by unknown parties, the Minister of Magic has access to a certain level of classified information in the Department of Mysteries, but they're not allowed to discuss those facts with anyone outside the Department of Mysteries. That is bullshit, the crude language didn't make a single eye twitch. There's a subsection in the law where with an internal vote inside the Department of Mysteries can lead the classified status to be revoked, or select people can be given temporary clearance status to the information but other than that, the Department of Mysteries holds the rights to the information produced by us, Croker answered with a straight face. As for this specific piece of information, there's no need to go through the procedure it's not something that would make a difference if more people knew it. I'm shocked how your department isn't overrun with corruption, Scrimgeier said with derision. We have our ways to keep everyone in check, said Croker, smiling mysteriously. And who knows, we might be teeming with corruption. Whatever, the work's been going on well, so no complaints. The way he said that was so potentially serious with such a light tone made people stare at him for a good second. I am assuming it was Augustus Rockwood who led that other party. Dumbledore continued the conversation along. Yes, Augustus Rockwood, an ex-unspeakable, Croker said that term as if he had tasted something bitter. He looked to Amelia, you know we don't have that. Ex-unspeakable. We have retired unspeakables, and they don't have to be oldies who don't work another day in their lives. We have plenty of young guys who leave us to pursue other interests but not a single ex-unspeakable that is, until Augustus Rockwood came along and the ministry had to make everything a media spectacle. We couldn't deal with Rockwood as we usually do with others in his position. If this time around, we find another Death Eater unspeakable we did a thorough check this time, but still, if we do please make sure that we get to deal with them this time. If we dealt with him back then, we wouldn't have this situation today. We will see to that. Let's get back to where we were before. In the case of ministry headquarters being compromised, like it came close becoming, the protocol for the Department of Mysteries is to pack up everything important and leave the premises. Even down at the 9th, people were in a hurry packing their respective inventory and what was used in the taboo magic is really specific and not useful for a lot of other magic so it was down the list of priority packing. It was somewhere in there that Rockwood and his group came in, took the stuff they needed, stunned the poor boy in charge of the area before leaving. Stunned not killed, asked Roberts. Rockwood knew better than to kill an unspeakable. He might have been one of our more battle-oriented members, but he knows that he wasn't the only one and the trouble it would bring him if he did kill in his old workspace. The smile on Croker's face was simple, but at the same time, it lacked the humor it was trying to portray. Can you stop the taboo? asked Perry. We can. Destroy the anchor to which the magic is tied or kill the caster. But I doubt we can either do that easily. Dumbledore said, in the last war, unspeakables were working on another method that would forcefully eradicate the magic. Are you working on something similar this time? You know too much, Dumbledore. We need to do something about that? Croker stared at Dumbledore in silence for a moment before speaking, yes, we are working on something. But because the approach to casting the magic is different than the last time, we are working up from the ground up. So, you don't know until when it will be ready, commented Dumbledore with a twinkle in his eye. No, we don't. Voldemort will. Unspeakables can speak his name, Dumbledore, that doesn't extend to you, said Croker. I understand it doesn't extend to me, but who said I can't cast something similar on my own? Croker's eyes observed Dumbledore. You have found a way to dodge the taboo magic. 
Of course, it was easy enough to figure it out the last time around Voldemort cast it. Dumbledore smiled and then Croker smiled. The two smiled at each other like the best of a friend until the door swung open, and a hit wizard came barging with a labored breath and hurry in his eyes. What is the meaning of this, Rust? asked Perry. Yes sir, a group of snatchers tied together were suddenly dropped at our back door entry and tee their hands sir their hands are crippled sir. As soon as everyone in the room heard about crippled hands, they got up as all brains pointed in the same direction. It's the invisible vigilante, sir. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Amelia Bones, Minister of Magic, this job better gets easier. Gawain Roberts, Head Auror, the lethality law is excellent, but they need to reduce the paperwork or at least streamline it. Rufus Scrimgeer, Head of DMLE, I want a wartime budget. Saul Croker, unspeakable, no comments. Chapter 376, Taboo Hunting for the past week, the smell of leaves and forest had become a mainstay in Quinn's life. I should have chosen a beach or something, said Quinn looking around the trees. Green is overrated anyway, but then he remembered his girlfriend and shelved that thought in the recycle bin. He canvassed the surrounding area for a bit before tapping his chest for the casual clothing to change into the noir gear, but it was in a forest camouflage shade rather than the usual black. All right, let's do it, Quinn did some stretches, including some vocal warm-ups. He waved his hand in front of his face for a mask to appear, and then the distorted voice said in a smiling tone, Voldemort. There was a rustle in the leaves as Quinn pulled on his gloves and clenched his fists at the sound of some laughter. He turned as the footsteps halted abruptly, and when he saw the group of people with ones out, their smiles drained as they recognized him. Snatchers you have done well to heed my call, he said, but it is regretful that you did so as this will not be pleasant. The snatchers didn't try to raise their wands to him, not a single spell was fired, instead, they immediately tried to apparate away with the entire area twisting in spatial movement. But the next moment, the spatial fabric of the area froze up, and all the snatchers were thrown to the ground. Please do not be in a rush to leave, you will be leaving, but not now, he had plans for them. The snatchers pushed themselves away from him, crawling on the ground with their shaking wands pointed at Quinn as he sedately walked towards them. S stay away away, you monster. Please please, let us leave. Sorry, sorry, I'll never do it a again. I am sorry. Quinn stared down at the begging and hobbling snatchers and said, too late, let us get started all of us have a long day ahead of us. He raised his hands, and smoke leaked out of his palms. Time to say farewell to the gift that you never appreciated. After he was done, Quinn bound up the guys with real ropes boosted with Empyrean jacket covering every individual as a precaution. He dove into their minds and did a cursory read on their activity on what they had done in their time as snatchers. I I have a wife at home, eked out one of the snatchers. You should have thought that before you joined hands with the Death Eater and raised your wands in the name of the Dark Lord, said Quinn, eyeing the binds one last time. He turned and operated away, leaving behind a groaning and begging mess. In another part of the forest, Quinn greeted another group of snatchers and watched their excitement and joy drain from their bodies, only to be replaced with a growing sense of despair and panic. Welcome, snatchers. Today is a glorious day in your lives, for you're finally going to be part of something great and meaningful, he said. He raised his arms, and smoke rushed out from beneath the bed of leaves around their feet. Say your goodbyes, you're going to experience what it feels to be like the muggles you all hunted for sport. Again, after he was done taking away the nerve activity in their hands, Quinn bound them up and again operate to yet another part of the same forest. Speak to me, snatchers, how much price do your Death Eater lords have put on my head, asked Quinn to the group of prone snatchers as the haze of soot of Tetany Nervum inched towards them. He had already done this a few times, and repeating the same operation so many times while listening to the same pleas of begging had gone boring and irritating. WW what? Snatchers are rewarded in gold for their captures. The minister has a bounty, Dumbledore has a bounty, even the boy who lived has gotten a bounty. So I wonder, how much gold does the Dark Lord deem my life to be of? I I don't don't know, is that so? Quinn looked at all the snatchers. A thought formed in his mind. He asked, does anyone know the bounty on my head? The one who answers will get a reward. A reward that every one of you will want, as he spoke, the hazy smoke stopped just before the snatcher's feet. Speak to me, snatchers, who wants the reward? But be cautious tell a lie, and I shall take your legs as well. In any normal situation, someone would attempt to lie in the desperation situation, but this was out of the norm none in the country hadn't heard of his work with Death Eaters. But it also meant that the snatchers were scared to even speak a single word, until. I I know. Quinn turned to the snatcher at the very back. He instinctively put on a friendly face behind his mask and asked him to tell. T the reward is why your weight in gold. My weight in gold. Quinn jerked back in surprise. The reason he had asked the question was only partly due to boredom and because his cursory glances had only given him the bounty of people the snatchers had bothered to look up muggleborns, blood traders, ministry officials, famous personalities but no one he had met had bothered to look him up. He hadn't checked this group yet. My weight in gold, he made quick calculations in his head, that will be more than you will get for either the Minister of Magic or Dumbledore. You had a chance to reap enough reward to have lasted all of you and several of your upcoming generations. But that is a far-off hypothetical. He got up from the wood log and said, you have done well, snatcher. 
I will keep my promise and give you your reward, as he said that, the Snatcher's fearful face gave way to hope which twisted in a showcase of betrayal as Quinn stunned him unconscious. Quinn turned to the other Snatchers and said, the reward was mercy. This magic, the smoke of Tentany Nervum inched forward, is quite painful, at least, now he isn't going to go through it awake. But for you, poor folk, get ready to familiarize yourself with pain. And no, please, please, God, help us. Quinn shook his head, God won't be coming today only pain. He turned to gather rope as the haze overtook the snatchers to finish the work that had been delayed due to boredom. Scene break. Amelia Bones, surrounded by full protection of hit wizards, looked at the group of battered men who looked as if they had been dangled at the edges of hell just to be pulled back just before hellfire got to them from behind a window. What is he muttering about? She asked Scrimgeer. The head of DMLE leaned in to say, they're repeating to stop it over and over again. Some victims of his magic are known to show such behaviors. Because of the pain. That and the feeling of not being able to feel their arms and legs can be quite overwhelming. Amelia cleared her throat before asking, are we sure this is him? Yes, it is him. Everything from the abnormal magic traces that don't match with ones and the magic itself resembles the previous samples we got from his confirmed victims. It is, without a doubt, him. Why is he doing this? I don't know. The door behind them swung open and slammed into the wall, with a young auror entering with a huff in his breath. He gulped and straightened when he felt the eyes of his superior's superiors many times superior on him. What is it? asked Scrimgeer. Yes sir, more groups of snatchers have appeared, he said in a rushed panic. What? They're at two of our subdepartment back gates, two of the hit wizards, general supply gates they are popping up using port keys in key locations in front of people's eyes. Get them out of there. We did, sir all of them are being filed into the jails but sir, I'm afraid we have already exceeded capacity. How many of them are there? F50 and counting, sir. Amelia and Scrimgeer exchanged shocked glances. Scrimgeer furrowed his brow as a thought struck him, and he turned to the junior auror, all of them are cursed? Their hands. The junior auror nodded. Another person entered the room, but unlike the junior auror, she entered silently and moved to the corner of the room where Saul Croker stood in the shadows. She leaned to his ear and whispered something under everyone's eyes and then stood to the side. Croker spoke, one of the snatcher groups has been delivered to one of our entrances it was our main entrance, he sighed, now we will have to change it. You don't seem worried, Amelia said. The invisible vigilante found something about the department of mysteries does that not bother you? It bothers me, Croker nodded, but there's nothing I can do about what has already happened we just will have to reaffirm our security. Now, I would like to take my leave, he said with the young female walked with him. I will have someone pick up the snatchers, said Scrimgeer. That won't be needed, Croker smiled. Those snatchers are known under our jurisdiction. Don't worry, we will pass them along to you after we are done with them. That's not acceptable. You can't hold them for questioning. Yes, we can. As per section 44 AODOM of the unspeakable code. Rubbish. Amelia saw that the two men were about to go down, so she barked the order to stand down. Behave like grown men. The unspeakables will have their time with the snatchers. But, there's no need for them to do so, Scrimgeer protested. We can interrogate them and pass along the information. It will be better if a single team interrogates every one of them. The Department of Mysteries has our own methods of interrogation. Scrimgeer snorted at that. Amelia sighed, the Department of Mysteries will get their time, but the second that passes, they will return the snatchers back to the Auror's office. As she was about to leave, another Auror came running in. What now, this time, Amelia herself exclaimed. There are more. Air, yes, ma'am, said the second junior Auror, but that isn't why I'm here. He turned to Scrimgeer, sir, there's another group, but there's another group, but this time it isn't snatchers this time it is Death Eater. Scrimgeer's eyes sharpened. We are going now, he said. But sir, there is more, the junior Auror gulped. The invisible vigilante himself dropped of them he left behind a message. Amelia gasped. Scrimgeer turned more severe than anyone thought possible. Saul Croker, who was about to leave, stopped and looked entirely interested in the conversation. What are we waiting for, said Croker. Let's see what the man of the day has to say. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, I sometimes partake in hunting. Saul Croker, unspeakable, section 44 AODOM of the unspeakable code is pretty legit. Chapter 377, Pink Chalk Glows is that the message. Two Aurors with a faint layer of magic surrounding their body carefully approached the group of tied up people dressed in Death Eater regalia. Those who had seen the previously delivered groups of Snatchers noticed how the Death Eaters had been handled with much less care than the Snatchers the heavy bruising all over their faces, which made it difficult to identify even a single one made it clear that no love was spared for this particular group of people. Rufus Scrimgeer narrowed his eyes at the big white envelope stained with mud stuck to the chest of one of the Death Eaters. He spoke to Amelia, it has your name on it do you perhaps know what it might be about? Of course not. How would I? I have only been face to face with the man for mere minutes. Anything he said in those minutes. You already know what he said in those minutes. You saw the memories firsthand. And I can't thank you enough for sharing them with us. Amelia hummed as she watched the Aurors dislodge the envelope after careful checking and consideration about the dangers it might contain. The Aurors hovered the envelope, each standing at a distance from it. 
The flap was gently unsealed, with the rest of the glued creases and folds coming undone to form a straight platform for the envelope's content to sit upon. What is that? asked Amelia. It is not a letter, to say the least, said Scrimgeer in reply, but even the seasoned Auror was confused by what he was seeing. On the disassembled envelope laid a palm-sized black puck that shined like a polished marble gleaming in the moonlight. The Auror handling the envelope and puck stepped closer and waved his wand over it, but just as the magic touched the puck, it vibrated, causing everyone to take a step back. The next second, the puck gained a life of its own and jumped off the paper onto the ground. Amelia immediately felt one rough hand each on her shoulder. She jumped in surprise and hurriedly glanced to her side to see her aura guard detail standing firm and alert. Madam Minister, the moment we deem the situation to be dangerous, we will be operating away along with you. Please don't resist. The apparition location will be a safe house in a discreet location maintained by the DMLE for such situations, said one of the aurors. Amelia nodded, recalling the week before she had taken chair as the Minister of Magic, where she had been briefed about all of the security details, and her time as the head of DMLE, where she had signed over the Minister's protection many a time. I understand, do whatever you must, she said. The black puck thrummed violently before going still silent. The puck's top glowed, and a shimmering image of a man holographed over the puck. The dark silhouette's image broke and flickered before the transparent shape of light stabilized, and the dark shadow lightened to reveal the silhouette's identity. Greetings, said the holographic image of the invisible vigilante. If you're seeing this means the carrier had delivered the message and the envelope was opened. I hope that the recipients are those in the ministry. This recorded message is taking responsibility for the use of my magic against the Snatchers and Death Eaters. It confused many about why the invisible vigilante would suddenly own up to his crimes. However, to those in the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, it was not unusual for terrorists to claim credit for their misdeeds and acts of terror. But this was unusual to even them. However, the reason real reason for sending this message is to urge the Department of Magical Law Enforcement to exploit the opportunity in front of you. The taboo cast by the Dark Lord Voldemort. Everyone around them gasped, expecting the recording to get interrupted any moment. While a curse can also be a boon if utilized so, the snatchers and death eaters who came joyously to my calls of the taboo were baited to arrive at the fate of losing their magic and paying for the sins they have committed. Turn the curse into a boon summon the snatchers, and once in a while, you will get a death eater. The hologram looked around as if he was actually seeing them. I will keep summoning them, take away their magic and leave them at your doorsteps. I say that the Department of Magical Law Enforcement weed them out until the Snatchers and Death Eaters no longer dare to answer the calls until Voldemort himself pulls his own magic down. War is upon this country, and it cannot be fought with one side if you do not become the other side, then I will. That is all. The puck's light flickered, and the holograph was extinguished, leaving behind the circular disc the message from the invisible vigilante. Scene break. Back in the same meeting room, the people in the previous meeting sat again to discuss but this time, they had a black puck sitting in the center of the table. More than 50 snatchers and six marked Death Eaters just to send a message, Amelia sighed. Scrimgeer sneered as he spoke, he's just an attention seeker, setting a bad example. I expected the bad example, but I thought he would be more discreet, he said while looking at Saul Croker. What does that mean? asked Croker. Oh, don't act clueless, Scrimgeer scoffed. He is clearly one of your unspeakables who knows if he is retired or is still working under your nose. Are you mad? What proof do you have? The vigilante called the Dark Lord by his name, clearly he didn't summon any snatchers or death eaters and he had been clearly summoning then left and right today, barked Scrimgeer. It was then that Dumbledore spoke up to defuse the situation. I won't refuse Scrimgeer's theory about the possibility of the invisible vigilante being an unspeakable, he looked to Croker, but speaking Voldemort's name isn't something only unspeakables can do. Croker's pupil shrunk as he studied Dumbledore before turning to Scrimgeer. The invisible vigilante is not part of my department. We have checked for that possibility multiple times. Or so you say. Who knows what goes down in that department of yours. Maybe lying through your teeth is part of that unnamed code of yours, Scrimgeer spoke in a biting tone. Dumbledore stood up from his chair, hands raised, both of you are wasting your time fighting. Let us all calm down and get on the same page because we will not get anywhere with all this fighting. He waited for Croker and Scrimgeer to calm down before continuing, now, let us converse like civilized individuals. What did we learn from that message? He apparently wants us to attack Death Eaters and Snatcher, Amelia sighed. I see no problems with it, said Scrimgeer. I have been suggesting that since the day the taboo went up around the country. It is crude, but I see no faults with that plan of action. I don't care for the snatchers, but every Death Eater can be a valuable source of information, Croker said and then eyed Scrimgeer. I know you don't have the permission to get inside, he tapped his temple, but if you hand them to me and don't ask questions, I can get you valuable information. Unspeakable Croker? That is out of law even for the Department of Mysteries. Amelia warned. It is war, Madam Minister, Croker shrugged. We need to employ some extreme measures in drastic situations and create such a dangerous precedent for your department. No, Amelia shook her head. The mind is out of interrogation boundaries for reasons. It is a right that every wizard and witch have and can't be breached in any circumstances. Croker sighed. He looked like he wanted to speak more but chose to stay silent and simply observe. What else? asked Amelia. 
Dumbledore replied, he is going to continue this up. The taboo will continue to summon snatchers and death eaters. If he continues this, there will come a time when groups of death eaters will answer the calls. I'm sure he will be fine, he will even welcome it but the people who make mistakes of calling Voldemort's name will suffer snatchers might be greedy for rewards, but death eaters wouldn't care. We need to up the efforts to highlight the taboo's danger, Amelia said with a serious note. If he will continue doing this, then I don't see why we should not. Prepare for the Aurors to replicate his work and keep it clean. There were connotations in those words made so that it was up to Scrimgeier to interpret what he meant by keeping it clean. It was Amelia's way of saying that the responsibility would lie solely on Scrimgeier's head if things went wrong. Understood, Madam Minister, Scrimgeier was happy with that. As the parties conversed, Dumbledore twitched his finger, and the puck silently slid across the table to him. He held it in his palm and stared with a train of thoughts running through his eyes. Water magic wasn't that uncommon, it might be just a coincidence, thought Dumbledore. Is there something wrong with the puck, Dumbledore, asked Amelia. Dumbledore shook his head. I am just observing it. Please continue, I will let you know if I find something. He silently reached into the oversized sleeves of his robes and pulled out a small vial of reddish pink chalk. Dumbledore could hear his heartbeat in his ears as he gently and sneakily directed his magic into both the chalk vial and puck. He clutched the vial in his grasp, hiding it within with only the upper part barely visible and only to Dumbledore himself. He slowly inched his hands closer until his came hand came to a halt. Dumbledore stared down at his clenched hand, and there, from the top, a reddish glow leaked out. Oh no, oh no, he thought, what have you done? Dumbledore, asked Moody. Albus Dumbledore looked up at his longtime friend, and for a moment, the man who seemingly had answers to every question was speechless. Dumbledore. Moody called again. Yes, Alastor. Is everything all right? Everything is all right. I was just wondering about his identity, the best way to lie was to tell the truth. Oh, do you think it is an unspeakable? No, I don't think it is an unspeakable. But he is talented. Moody grunted in agreement, he stabbed the Dark Lord in his eye, so I will give it to the lad. Yes, Dumbledore threw out a distracted reply. After a moment, he slid the puck back to the table's center and pocketed the small vial of chalk. Did you find something of interest, Dumbledore? asked Croker curiously. Maybe something that could lead us to the real invisible vigilante. Dumbledore put on a regretful smile and shook his head, nothing I can find right now. After that, Dumbledore leaned back into his chair, and for the rest of the meeting, he nodded and responded with half-baked answers. It had been a while since he had found something that had greatly occupied his mind. The last time he had felt this was when he had found Harry Potter was a horcrux. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Invisible vigilante, Quinn West, that took a couple of takes to record. Albus Dumbledore, headmaster, like a thunderbolt. Chapter 378, finally visible Quinn stood inside Flourish and Blot's inner corner, where all the boring books sat away from the popular products that made the store money. But to Quinn, the newest batch of research journals was why he liked to visit bookstores regularly. As long as he could apparate to it, he wanted to go on his own be it books or materials where he couldn't, he had people scouring for the latest. It was a peaceful time as he slowly flipped through the research paper titles and abstracts. It was the middle of a Tuesday with everyone working their jobs in their place of work. There weren't Hogwarts students plugging up the bookstore as they would before the start of the year. So Quinn could calmly browse the catalog without any unnecessary and unneeded disruption. Mr. West. The edge of the paper slipped from Quinn's hand as he turned his head towards the person who had called his name. He turned back to his book and groaned as he slowly closed the journal and returned it to the shelf. This is ridiculous, he said. It's like every time I go out, one of you people comes finding me when I'm looking to relax. He looked around, is there someone following me around? I'm not a media celebrity, you know I'm not supposed to be recognized in public, neither am I supposed to be followed around. After he had graduated, he had run into Saul Croker, unspeakable from the Department of Mysteries, and Rufus Scrimgeier, the head of DMLE. He had even met with Amelia Bones, the Minister of Magic, but that was because of his own actions. And now he was meeting Albus Dumbledore, the head of the Order of Phoenix. He turned to his ex-headmaster to ask, so, what gives, professor? Should I travel in stealth now? If people want to meet me, they can always set up appointments with my secretary. You have a secretary. No, I do not. Then. Exactly. You get it, Quinn said with a straight face before sighing. What is it that I can do for you today, professor? It would be better if we talk in private. Quinn observed Dumbledore with a critical eye, blatantly not hiding his doubt regarding this private invitation. Dumbledore didn't reveal his intention, silently insisting that it was a matter not to be discussed in public. After a few seconds of stare down, Quinn shrugged and decided to tag along with Dumbledore, who led him to a small tea shop on the secondary street of Verdict Alley. When they entered, Dumbledore nodded to the man on the counter. Quinn stopped at the counter, shook the man's hand and asked for his name, and created the man's profile in his mind, adding the possible order of Phoenix tag to it. They sat down on the innermost table in the corner of the petite shop. After receiving what they had ordered, the two men finally got to talking. Can we talk now, Professor? asked Quinn, sipping on his lemonade. Dumbledore raised his hand and slowly swiped it in the air for a cover of magic to envelop them. Quinn narrowed his eyes at the magic to find it to be a privacy ward, a strong one at that. 
He looked back at Dumbledore with a quirked brow. All right, you have colored me curious. What warrants so much cloak and dagger? Dumbledore reached into his robes and placed a small vial that could be comfortably held between the index finger and thumb on the middle of the table. What is that? asked Quinn, eyeing the reddish pink substance inside. He was about to crack a joke when he noticed the serious look in Dumbledore's usually smiling eyes. What is it? This is the composite used as the catalyst in the ward that surrounded the Goblet of Fire in the Great Hall. The moment the words exited Dumbledore's words, Quinn's acclumency kicked in as he manually controlled, but he kicked himself in the head as for a split second all emotion drained from his face. You remember this, correct? We talked about it that year when I was trying to find the caster. I wasn't able to find them back then but I finally found them now. Quinn silently stared at Dumbledore. He had become excessively cautious for a moment, but as he thought about it, he calmed down. The Triwizard Tournament was a long time ago, and it wasn't like he had done anything wrong if protecting his friends was wrong, then he was fine paying for that violation. Oh, who is it? Are they still in Hogwarts? That'd be mighty impressive if they are. Dumbledore stared deep into Quinn's eyes as he continued, I was in the meeting with the Minister of Magic, we were discussing the Invisible Vigilante's latest. Quinn's heart skipped a beat, and he had sent the Ministry a message in the form of light and illusion magic spelled into a small black stout cylindrical object and imagine my surprise that when I by chance tried to compare the magical signatures on that and this, he pointed to the vial, they were a near perfect match. Invisible Vigilante was the person I had been looking for all these years. Oh. Dumbledore leaned forward, and the shop went eerily quiet, it was as if the ambient noise had been sucked up, leaving a sound vacuum. Don't pretend to be clueless. I had long confirmed that this chalk dust was yours, there was no reason for me to bring it up but I tested the two things for some remote intuition that I wasn't thinking would be true and to my surprise, they matched. I had found the invisible vigilante's hidden identity it was you all along. You, Quinn West, was are the invisible vigilante. Quinn studied Dumbledore's face for a moment before he straightened up, and all fabricated emotion drained from his face. The old headmaster had made up his mind, and no matter what Quinn said wasn't going to change his mind, so why bother pretending? Magical signatures can't be used in the court of law because of the unreliability issues associated with the method, said Quinn in a plain voice. Magical signatures were actively used by DMLE to narrow the list of suspects and focus their efforts in the right direction, but the findings couldn't be used in front of a judge and a Weizengamot jury. Remember who you're talking to, Mr. West, Dumbledore's steady tone had gained a terse quality. I do not make mistakes, especially when it comes to this. You can't prove it was me, Professor. No one can. Dumbledore leaned back into his chair, looking at Quinn with still unbelievable eyes. How could I not see this before? There were a few signs here and there. The advanced water magic that year at the Great Lake and the invisible vigilante's penchant to use ice magic and the aggressive use of water magic in the ministry against Voldemort they could have been compared and you displayed proficiency in water magic during the second task. Dumbledore's words left a bitter taste in Quinn's mouth. In the intense situation of facing Voldemort, he had unleashed his water magic capabilities in public under the guise of the invisible vigilante. I knew that day at the Great Lake would come to bite me in the back, thought Quinn. Dumbledore, oblivious to Quinn's thoughts, pointed to his hands. No one has ever seen the invisible vigilante use a wand. The DMLE and even I thought that he was using some other form of focus, but it turned out he was not using one at all you showed flashes of wandless magic in Hogwarts, especially near the end and after Hogwarts, I had heard you had rested your wand, I thought you were growing splendidly as you became older and gained more experience never did I thought that you were holding back since who knows when. The headmaster of Hogwarts, the one who had defeated one Dark Lord and had been a thorn in the second ones, seemed tired as he stared at Quinn incredulously. The Novellus Oxyonites attack at Hogsmeade in 1993, that's where you made your public appearance. You were 14 years old that year a 14 year old who thrashed grown adults into walls and stabbed them with ice spikes. Was that your first endeavor, or did you start before that with some incident that the DMLE hasn't credited to you? While Dumbledore tried to wrap his head around the fact that the invisible vigilante could have started as a 14 year old kid behind a mask, Quinn was thinking with his mind running at hyperspeeds. What was he going to do now one of the most influential men in the country was convinced that he was the invisible vigilante. What is this, professor? Quinn shook his head. Why are you trying to match to unrelated people? How could I be the invisible vigilante? I wasn't even in the country during the Dark Lord's attack on the ministry. I was out in America when all of that happened. There is ample proof in government records, and there were people who saw me there in case you're thinking of going to the DMLE with this ridiculous theory of yours. You're right, I'm not going to the Aurors with this, Dumbledore shook his head. You're very fortunate to be born in the family you were born in, Mr. West. You have access to things people can only dream of. You are right, I don't have any way to legally prove that you're the invisible vigilante. Even if I could, your grandfather would prevent you from facing any charges. There was something Quinn could finally agree with. If push came to shove and his identity was finally revealed, his grandfather would ensure that he wasn't put into Azkaban for his actions. The ministry might actively pursue him for his crimes, but he would never be tried if George West had some say in it and George West usually had a say in everything. And because of that, I feel no guilt to use this information for my own purposes. What? I'm going to go to your grandfather and tell him all about this. 
I will tell him my findings my theory and I'll show him your reaction today to convince him that you're the invisible vigilante. Wait. I'm going to then put forward a proposition. He provides me all the support I need for the war against Voldemort in exchange for my keeping quiet about the truth. Listen here. George will understand the severity of the situation. He will know what this information can do coming from my mouth. He will, on his own, recall how the current leadership of DMLE feels about the invisible vigilante and the ministry's changed stance on the wanted criminal. And to make sure that his grandson's life isn't tainted by such a dark spot, he will cooperate with me and provide. Dumbledore. Quinn roared as he smashed the side of his fist on the petite table. The small tea shop shook as if an earthquake was coursing the bricks of the building. The short shopkeeper on the counter stood up with his wand out, but Dumbledore waved him down to ensure everything was fine. Don't push it, Dumbledore, Quinn glowered. If there's one thing I don't like, that's someone trying to take advantage of those close to me. Dumbledore stood up calmly from his chair and looked down at Quinn. You've been blessed with prosperity many couldn't even dream to imagine, so I say it is time to pay up. His face turned bitter as he continued, You're a killer, Mr. West. So young but with blood on your hands. You shouldn't have gone through that and for that, I profusely apologize. But I need your grandfather's help to prevent that from ever happening, and this is the quickest way to accomplish that. Oh, don't give me that, scoffed Quinn. You have blood plenty on your hands, Dumbledore. Don't try to dress all of that in a pretty package and try to guilt trip me along with all the emotional pointers you just threw. Dumbledore showed a bitter smile. He nodded deeply, I know, Mr. West. I am well aware of that. He looked down at his hands with a brief haunted look in his eyes. He didn't say a single more word and turned away to leave. What if I tell him myself, said Quinn immediately. Dumbledore stopped, turned his head, and shook his head, it's not going to make a difference. I apologize for doing this. I would have never done this if it wasn't for the current circumstance. It is all for the greater good. Quinn wanted to say so much hearing that, but Dumbledore continued to walk away, and the words died in his mouth as other thoughts took more forceful priority. He stared at where Dumbledore had placed the chalk vial that he had taken away. He had to make plans. And he had to make them quick. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, oh, shut up. Albus Dumbledore, defeater of Dark Lord, it is for the greater good. Fiction only reader, author, again, a reminder. Read chapter 155, as I thought if you're confused and need a short recall. Chapter 379, Making Preparations Quinn paced in his room with heavy worry echoing in his every step. It felt like his knees were injected with lead, and his saliva had been replaced with something much more viscous. His body felt hot, something his body tended to do when his brain ran under extreme pressure and in uncomfortable situations. Dumbledore knew his identity as the invisible vigilante. Shit, shit, shit. It was a huge problem. The moment his grandfather came to know that he had been hunting down terrorists under a mask, all his freedom would be taken away from him. George head of the family West would do everything in his power to restrict Quinn's movement it didn't matter Quinn was already of age adult, George was going to do everything he could to make sure Quinn didn't have breathing room. Ah, uh, why did I lose my control? The meeting with Dumbledore was a trap that he had walked in unwillingly without a single shred of persuasion. If Dumbledore had gone directly to George, while it would have left Quinn blindsided, he could have talked his way out of it, and even if George didn't believe him and placed people around him, he could have given them the beat. But Dumbledore had sacrificed that advantage to gain another one in exchange for informing Quinn that he was going to George, he had gained Quinn's reaction. And he had given precisely the reaction Dumbledore wanted. He had pulled up a clemency and had failed to fabricate emotion on his face for discreet purposes. That single fault had made it look like Quinn was hiding he was either the invisible vigilante or knew who the invisibility vigilante was. The latter had been struck off the board because Dumbledore could prove that Quinn was the invisible vigilante when it came to magic, Dumbledore was an authority who many people believed and George West was among those people. There were enough cascading layers of things against Quinn that even if he lied, George wouldn't believe him outright. Trust, but not blindly, was one of George West's favorite mottos, and when he was in doubt, he would do his own digging, and things were bound to seem suspicious with the timing of things, and George didn't need proof admissible by law to form his conclusions. Even before all that, Quinn couldn't lie to his grandfather. In case he lied and George believed it, and then later it came out that he was indeed the invisible vigilante all along that would shatter the trust between grandfather and grandson with cracks and damage spreading to his other relationship as well. Could he stop the meeting between Dumbledore and George? He could not, stopping Dumbledore physically, magically, wasn't going to work, and he couldn't imagine any other way he could stop either one of them. Dumbledore wanted the benefits that the West resources could provide him, and George would want to meet Dumbledore so he could keep the news from going out. Fighting Dumbledore? It could either end badly or make enough ruckus to attract unwanted eyes. The chances of safe victory were not high enough for him to take the path that could backfire on him. The question that remained was if he should be the one to break the news to George or if he should let Dumbledore do it. George was out of the country for a couple of days, which meant that Dumbledore wouldn't find George until then. I can't be sure. Dumbledore could go abroad just to have the talk faster. It made sense as George would be out of his comfort place and would be more perceptible to Dumbledore's demands. Quinn sighed. The reason he was even thinking of letting Dumbledore break the news was that it may come to that. 
He needed some essential time to make some moves because whatever was going to happen, things were going to go downhill for him in various ways, and he had to make the preparation needed to face whatever was to come. Quinn sat himself on the edge of the bed his eyes heavy with thought and contemplation. The sun in the sky traveled its course as the shadows in the room slowly shifted. It was after an hour since he had gone still and silent that Quinn stood up from his bed, walked to his walk-in closet, and after a while, he came out dressed for going out with his suitcase in hand. Polly, the West House elf popped into the room. Her big eyes went to Quinn's suitcase and then to his clothes before she looked at his face. There were no questions from her, but Quinn knew what she wanted to ask. I'm going to a friend's place for a bit, said Quinn, spinning another lie to tell his family. I will come back in a few days, but if someone in the family asks, I'm at Marcus Belby's house. Ms. Rosie already has his address and his Magi fax details. When they return home, please inform them that it was a last-minute decision. No one was home, making it the perfect point to leave. Quinn bid farewell to the clueless Polly, who didn't know what was going on inside. It could be that this was one of the final times for a while she would be able to go to Quinn with a single thought. Scene break. Quinn stared at the building in front of him. It was a building entirely opposite to Gringotts, the thought entered his mind just like it had entered the last time he had seen the building. A soul-sucking black without a fleck of dust marring a surface so polished that one could see its reflection. He walked to the glass doors of the establishment with his eyes glancing at the name written in gold overhead. Monolith. The symbol of terror and reassurance. The bank's policy don't steal from us, and we will keep your money safe, secured, and growing. Monolith was a classic private bank that catered to affluent clients with an abundance of wealth like West and provide them with facilities like essential banking services, brokerage, limited tax advisory, concierge-type services, discretionary asset management, and the vast array of wealth management. They were infamous stating for their secrecy promises. Once money goes into Monolith, it's difficult for an outsider to get information about who holds what and how much, they promise that your financials are going to be kept under a tight seal, of course, they won't help you break the law bend around the law, sure but not breaking the law. And because they only service high asset clients, who have rock solid financial stability, it ensures that Monolith won't go bankrupt, thus making it extremely safe for them to hold people's assets. He had made a portkea of the location he had already seen and triggered it to travel to Basel, Switzerland, where the bank that managed his magical money had been securely stored. The lobby only had one greeting table, and the lobby somehow didn't look desolate despite the lack of any other furniture. Behind the long white patterned marble table sat three women in the prime of their beauty, dressed in identical attire. As he approached them, the middle woman looked up from her work there was a brief daze in her eyes before clarity descended in her eyes. Welcome, Mr. West, she slightly bowed, we weren't expecting you today, nevertheless, we at Monolith and ecstatic that you are here visiting. Thank you, Amaril, Quinn greeted the front desk concierge and glanced at her identical sisters Cheryl and Daffodil. This much hadn't changed ever since his last visit to the bank. What brings you here today, Mr. West, Amaril asked politely. I would like to meet Gare. Mr. Gare might not be able to meet you today, Mr. West, she sounded troubled. He only meets clients through appointments so that his day is planned out. He might not be willing to meet you right now. Tell him it is urgent, said Quinn simply. Amaril turned to her workstation, and her hands moved behind the thick table. Quinn couldn't tell what she was doing, but he could sense some magic being operated. In the meantime, Quinn turned to the little stone gremlins perched on the walls and ceiling around the huge room. He watched as one of the gremlins' eyes followed him like a security camera. He stared at the stone gremlins intently and kept his eyes on one of the stone gremlins. After a minute, Amaril turned to Quinn with a beautiful smile, Mr. Gare will meet you, Mr. West. He is getting free within the next hour and has asked that you wait in his personal guest lounge that he uses to entertain his guests. They walked into the inner part of the bank through an entrance in the inner wall of the lobby and entered a room with a dozen doorways. They stepped into the doorway with the number 4 in Roman numerals etched above. Number 4 was known as the West Gate as through there one can go to the part of the bank that handles the West Fortune. They walked through a few corridors, passing by many doors and coming across a few people who would make pleasantries with Amaril, who didn't seem particularly about most of them. After they exited the corridors, the interior changed into a classic Renaissance design, much different from the rest of the bank. They soon reached a pair of dark wood doors. A pale woman sat outside the door, to a side behind a desk. She wore thin-rimmed circular glass with messy brown curls flowing down her shoulders. Quinn readily greeted the woman, Ixquick, it has been a while. I hope you're doing well. Ixquick stared at Quinn with her half-dazed eyes. For a moment, they simply stared before Ixquick's eyes regained focus. She got up and took over from Amaril and led him to an ornate lounge to wait. How are you, Ixquick? How is the life of a living blood bag? Asked Quinn calmly. It has been fruitious. How is your health? I hope no complications on that front. My health has been fine, thank you. My body has adapted itself to it. Quinn asked a couple more questions, but the answers were all curt bare minimum words, so after a while, he stopped asking and closed his eyes in waiting, going through his memories. Around an hour later, he was roused up from his memory traversal and said that Gare was ready to meet him. Ixquick pushed one pane of the double doors open with her entire body. Please go in, she gestured to him. Quinn entered the styled office, with Ixquick not going in with him. 
a wall covered with bookshelves, artwork framed on the others, a sitting area around a table in one part of the room, wooden cabinets fitted with glasses, and the most eye-catching part of the room were animal heads mounted on the upper walls lion, tiger, wolf, elk, among other non-magical animals but then there were the magical species, and that collection was impressive from every angle an Egyptian sphinx, a Peruvian viper-toothed dragon, a South American fire drake, a white-feathered griffin, and the list went on. Sitting in the center of the office was a man in his prime, dressed in a simple white shirt and black pants, leaning into his chair behind a simple yet ornate four-legged desk. Quinn West, said the ancient vampire in his deep voice. Why are you here without any prior intimation? The blood-red eyes stared at Quinn as if trying to peer through all of his secrets. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, I need to literally run now. Idris Gare, vampire, very old, flirty, laid back, has raised his own blood bank. Ix quick, blood bank, blood woman, I don't speak much. Chapter 380, funds from the vampire Quinn and Gare sat in front of each other in the latter's office. I don't like to meet people without appointments, Quinn West. If you didn't know it before, know it now, said Gare. The ancient vampire was as Quinn remembered him last time, he still seemed lazy and looked like he was on the verge of sleeping, but there was a flicker of annoyance in the red eyes. Even if it is your grandfather, I would take offense if he came here unannounced. Gare sighed, and if there was a place where a sigh would seem natural, it was on him. But now that you are here tell me what you're here for. I can't send someone so far away from away. Quinn was in no mood to exchange quips with Gare, so he got straight to the point. I need to withdraw some funds from my account here. I hope you kept some of my wealth in liquid reserve. Excluding your emergency fund, I have kept 1% of the gold you initially allocated to me. 1%. Quinn furrowed his brow. That was lower than he thought. According to the last report I read, the coinage was still at 5%, said Quinn. You haven't been keeping up with the reports, Gare quirked his eye. Quinn's wealth was invested in a wide portfolio, all of it was handled by three firms the broker, who managed his non-magical investments the West's Basel office, which dealt with a large portion of the entire West family's wealth and the monolith bank which provided the West's with its financial services. Quinn had divided his wealth among the three firms to not put all his eggs into one basket, moreover, every one of them had a different skill set and ideology towards investment, which would give Quinn gains, or losses, in diverse areas. Out of all three, he had only asked Monolith and Gare to hold cash reserves, with the other two keeping the entire reserves bound up in investments. He got audited reports on a monthly, quarterly, and annual basis on the health of his wealth but unfortunately, to no fault of anyone else, Quinn had not gotten the time to read the recent reports. I admit, I have not been keeping up with them, Quinn sighed. 5% of a third of his wealth would have barely gotten him through what he was planning, but 1% wasn't something he was not at all comfortable with. Isn't 1% quite less, he asked. Gare sighed, including the trust fund made for you by your grandfather, 1% of what I had was more than enough even for the exorbitant expenses you have. You know, I have heard of many young lads who spend left and right without care, but even among them, you're near the top. Quinn pursed his lips. He spent a lot of money every month on research and development. Magic was a free resource that only took regular meals and good sleep every day to regenerate but progressing in magic wasn't cheap, at his level, it took a lot of resources to get to the next level. I want that 1% and the emergency fund, Quinn asked Gare, still inside, he felt that the funds weren't going to be enough. The situation was still contained, so he could go to the Basel office and ask them to liquidate some funds, but that would take time which he didn't have, and the moment situation broke out, the doors to the Basel office would be closed to him. I will have to with this for now, thought Quinn. It meant that he had to go to the broker at some point to liquidate his portfolio there unlike the Basel office, the broker was his personal contact. Why do you want so much cash? Gare took out a sheet of paper and a pot of ink. Are you planning to buy something big? Instead of answering the question, Quinn posed one of his own to Gare. Are you employed by my grandfather solely or am I also paying you? Gare unscrewed the ink bottle and curled his finger up for red ink to float out of the bottle. Quinn blinked at the ink that flowed to the paper and started to form words. Vampires were magical creatures, but they weren't supposed to use them like this. Then it hit Quinn. You use blood and ink, he said, surprise clear on his face. He used blood magic to confirm his theory. I do, said Gare nonchalantly as the blood printed words on the paper like a printer. Is it Ixquicks? Human blood is not suitable for inks. This is a blend of inks from different beasts and creatures had it custom made by a good friend of mine, Ricci. Another vampire. Of course, only a vampire can know blood so well, I haven't seen an ink so good with or without magic. Gare swiped his hand, and the paper sheet slid to the slide, but then a new sheet of paper slid in front of him. Quinn's jaw loosened. He had thought that the first sheet moved because of the blood ink, but it seemed that even the sheets even themselves had blood in them. Quinn looked around the room, wondering what else in the room was infused with blood or blood magic. I am employed by the West family business, your grandfather, your sister, and you, answered Gare without looking up. What? The answer to your previous question. I treat business and people as separate entities I handle the business accounts, but I also handle the personal accounts of George, Leah, Elliot, and Rosie. Elliot and Ms. Rosie as well? They qualify as clients for Monolith. The bank only took customers who could meet their standards of wealth. 
Elliot Dalton and Rosie Vivian are both extremely rich. Years working with your grandfather have its gains. Both of them are prolific investors and have invested in various companies. They might not earn as much as you do, but their portfolio is nothing to sneeze at. Especially, Elliot Dalton a majority of his businesses complement some arm of the West business, so when that subsidiary grew, Elliot's business would grow as well. That surprised Quinn. But now was not the time to expand on the situation. Would you share my information with my grandfather? Why would I do that? Asked Gare, still writing up papers. I don't have the habit of discussing client information with others. Even if it is George West, Quinn used the full name. Even if it is, George West, he can make problems for you. I am well aware he's a big enough client that if he asks, the board will kick me out even though I have a share in the bank why are you asking? He will come looking for me in a few days. Why? Are you running away from home? When Quinn didn't speak, Gare looked up. Seriously you're too old to run away from home, aren't you an adult now? Holy blood, why would you do that? Some stuff, don't worry about it. Quinn waved it off. Grandfather will come looking, and when he does, don't say anything to him. He will ask for the records of every single purchase I made through my account here, but I don't want you to give him anything. Got it. This will cause problems for you. Gare closed the ink pot and leaned back into his chair, looking like he was sitting on a rocking chair by a fireplace. I have been doing this job for who knows how long and have made some great money doing it more than I can spend in this century even with all I spend. The pale man seemed apathetic as he spoke every word. The only reason I do this job is that I'm good at it. It doesn't matter to me if George gets me fired. I'm a partner in the bank, even if they do kick me out, the money will keep coming in. I will go find something fun though I will be disappointed in George and honestly, I do not think he will have me fired a man should have integrity and me protecting my client shows it, Gare shrugged. Run away all you want, Quinn West, I shall keep my tongue to myself your secrets will stay safe with me. Gare rang a bell, and Ixquick came in. He handed her the papers, and she took them away. Quinn studied Gare. He thanked the man but inside, all he could think was what it would be that old. The vampire was the oldest man Quinn had ever met, and it made him curious to think how life changed after one had done one single job longer than most people lived. Maybe Mr. Allen would know, he must have lived someone who lived that long, a stray thought passed his mind that made him smile bitter having thoughts about magic in such situations showed him something about priorities. Thank you, Mr. Gare. Now that he had the money, he had other preparations to make. Scene break. Quinn had returned home the next day and was walking past the lounge to his room when he heard his name called out. He turned and entered the lounge to find George sitting alone, nursing a drink in his hand. The room was dimly lit by a table-side lamp and the gentle moonlight coming through the windows. It is late, grandfather. You shouldn't be drinking so late in the night, said Quinn sitting down in front of him. It was strange for him to see George drink anywhere outside his cellar that place specially built for enjoying a drink built for George West to enjoy a drink in peace. I heard you were at Marcus home, said George. How's the lad doing? He's going to start his training the next week. He told me, said Quinn, he had known that for a while now. I'm still planning that trip with him. It needs to happen before I go for my apprenticeship and Eddie starts his career in earnest, so I want him to have a good chunk of time off. Have a talk with Elliot, said George. I will. I will. Quinn studied George, and his grandfather seemed to be distracted and looked like he had a little too much to drink. Are you all right, grandfather? I'm fine, my child, said George, taking another sip from his glass. Quinn stood up and walked to George to take the glass. You should stop drinking. It's already late, go to sleep. George stood up and looked like he was going to stagger, so Quinn gave him support, but he raised his hand to say he was fine. George patted Quinn on his shoulder before walking away. Quinn cleaned up the room before walking out himself to find Ms. Rosie standing at the door. Do you know why he was like that? He asked. It is the day he lost her your grandmother's death anniversary. You were in Hogwarts this time of the year, so you wouldn't know, said Ms. Rosie. She raised her hand to Quinn's cheek and gently caressed it. He has lost too much already, my dear. You and Leah are all he has left. Treat him well. Quinn nodded. She smiled and walked away into the darkness. I'm sorry, he muttered alone. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, time to get that gold. Idris Gare, vampire, yeah. I have blood in a lot of my things. Fiction only reader, author, next couple of chapters are going to be around the current topic. This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below.